Today, we meet Iman. Iman loves coffee, salads, and deeply identifies with her sign Libra. She has a supportive community of friends and family. Iman has one brother, two living parents, and two young children. Depending on context, she identifies as a proud Montrealer. She has used the terms visible minority or person of color, but now mainly identifies herself as a black woman. For her, these are the two parts of her identity that speak to her the most, to be black and to be a woman. Her journey has been marked with many triumphs and tribulations. The start to her career was rockier than expected after completing her undergraduate degree. She moved between short-term contracts and part-time work in the nonprofit sector. She realized that her life wouldn't follow the expected university to successful career narrative. After graduating with a master's in social work, she started a permanent job at a local nonprofit supporting single mothers. Her first few weeks were motivating and challenging. She felt welcomed. She had a cordial relationship with her colleagues, the majority of whom were white and she had a lot of passion for her work. After a few weeks, she began to notice dynamics that made her feel uneasy. She began to wonder, was I just a token diversity hire or was I hired for my skills and experience? Every time there was a new racialized client, they were automatically referred to her. As Iman was talking to a colleague of color, a white colleague walked by them and said, I guess this must be the cultural diversity office. Her ideas in team meetings were often not taken seriously or dismissed without due consideration. She was infantilized by her coworkers. When she would assert herself, her colleagues would tell her to calm down and that there was no need to be so aggressive. Finally, she decided to meet with human resources to strategize about how to deal with these experiences. After all, the HR coordinator had repeatedly encouraged Amon to go see her if she had any issues that she wanted to discuss confidentially. The HR coordinator responded, but that's not possible. We are a community organization. Nobody on the team wants to hurt anyone. You're too sensitive. Our workplace has always been welcoming to everyone. The other immigrant staff have never complained. How can you say there are racist dynamics? She says to herself, I keep on being read as angry or aggressive. I have often been in situations where I am wary of how I will be seen, that I have to compensate so much that I undermine what I am trying to accomplish. In the following days, the HR coordinator discusses Iman's situation with the executive director who calls a meeting with Iman. The executive director says, there may be problematic dynamics now and then, but no one was intending to say hurtful things. It's a lack of education. Maybe you could provide a training on diversity and inclusion? Iman feels very anxious. She is very familiar with this dynamic, having worked in the community sector for over a decade. Organizations often say that it's a priority to hire people of color. But once hired, there are no resources to support us, and we are forced to fit into a mold that is palatable to the interests of the organization. Over the next few weeks, Iman takes on organizing training sessions and convening discussions with her colleagues on current dynamics and racial microaggressions. At first, there seems to be openness, but over time, Iman notices that the microaggressions did not stop. On top of it all, the team continues to expect her to educate them about any and all diversity and race-related issues even informally outside the work context. She says to herself, even if you do not like your job, it's not something you can escape. You and your family need it to live. When someone says something racist in the streets, you can always cross the street, but you can't change jobs so easily. There is a certain captivity to the workplace. Today, the story actually begins before Iman enters the organization. This isn't a utopia, race and gender dynamics still exist. However, there is an organization that has taken the time to look within. They challenge themselves and foster conditions wherein Black, Indigenous, and other women and femmes of color will be seen and heard. When Iman enters, her skill sets and lived experiences are honored and appreciated. She isn't expected to take on all race-related matters. There is enough integrated knowledge of diversity and anti-racism practices on the team. She feels trusted. She knows that she can raise issues if they arise and that her colleagues will provide thoughtful and considerate feedback. If there is conflict, there are clear ways to address them. Work is work, and so it isn't always easy, but she is paid a living wage. She has access to benefits and can leave her work at the office while holding on to feelings of being appreciated and honored. Over time, Iman gains new skills and can see how her contributions help the organization change for the better. She has a positive impact on the community. She stays in the organization because she chooses to. Over the years, she meets and mentors other Black women and femmes in the sector, and together, they learn, grow, 
and heal.